Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Zarelli, faculty director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. And um, we made it to the ripe old age of 20. So here we are. Happy birthday, CSGS. <laughs> right, exactly. Anyway, um, so I'm going to make some remarks, and then we're going to get on with our first faculty panel uh, tonight. Hopefully, you all have the program. As you know, we have one faculty panel tonight, and we will have uh, two panels tomorrow, three panels tomorrow, actually. And we hope you can join us again tomorrow. If you don't have the program, it's right outside here. Uh, well, I came to Chicago in 2008, and that was two years after the CSGS, at that time the Center for Gender Studies, had celebrated its 10th anniversary. So in trying to think about how to introduce our 20th anniversary or celebrate it, I decided to go back and take a look at some of the newsletters that were published by the center, um, and in particular, the very first newsletter that was published, where our inaugural director was Leora Auslander, who is on this panel right here. And I got to see, as I was saying to a few of you earlier, I got to see what everyone looked like 20 years ago. And you all, you know, you all still look really great. Uh, but in any case, um, and I read through Leora's account of what the center's mission was, because this was the very first uh, newsletter. So I'm reading, the center's mission is to foster interdisciplinary research on teaching on feminism, on the social construction of men and women, on the power of metaphors of masculinity and femininity, <clears throat> and on gay and lesbian studies. Leora went on to state that the center is especially interested in fostering collaborative work on the part of faculty and students alike to reach across the traditional divisions of knowledge production as they are encoded in the boundaries between divisions, schools, and disciplines, to build bridges to people in the greater Chicago community who share similar concerns, and to become part of a larger network of people working across the country on gender and sexuality issues. So reading Leora's remarks, I was really struck by how much of that original mission remains in more recent iterations of the center's goals and purpose. And it's not as if the specific emphases or concerns that animate our work here today have not changed, but I think that the broad understanding of why we need such a center has remained reasonably constant. For me, this is not a cause for despair, as if we had not had the energy to fully reinvent ourselves, but rather an indication of how crucial our work continues to be for understanding deeply sedimented conceptions of gender and sexuality as they have structured and continue to structure all aspects of human society. And yet, while remaining um, optimistic about the remarkable continuity of the center's trajectory over the last 20 years, I was also struck by some remarks by Joan Scott, who gave the inaugural lecture. Professor Scott, that was in 1996, Professor Scott talked about having a sense of what she called <coughs> deja vu while preparing her lecture, having attended many such events in what at that time amounted to over two decades of the institutionalization of women's gender and sexuality studies. The center, as many of you now know, was founded in 1996, which was quite late by national standards and probably quite early by Chicago standards. Um, sorry, John, I know. <laughs> and, and Scott was reflecting on the 20 or so years that she had been part of the movement to establish gender and women's studies at various universities. Quote, what does it mean that gender has been recognized as a legitimate area of study at the University of Chicago? Has the, I know, don't laugh yet. Has the feminism that informs the project grown sufficiently mature and sophisticated to be welcome here? But does that mean it has lost its radical critical edge? <laughs> Scott went on to wonder, in what she describes as a more apocalyptic tone, whether the Chicago Center marks the founding of the last of the gender centers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Joan, 
Yeah, I know. Uh, Jones, okay, so Jones Scott then goes on to say that, you know, she's not trying to predict the future here and she didn't want to rain on the party. That was the inauguration of the center, being, as she put it, too polite a guest and too bad at predictions. But she did reflect on a few issues that she felt were relevant to the future of gender studies and that do seem to me to be of continued relevance today. Firstly, when we look back at the founding of national women's and gender studies programs in the late 60s and 70s, we can see that the struggle involved persuading parties internal to the university who thought it would, among other putative casualties, make the university a laughingstock. This internal resistance was eventually overcome not only thanks to the persistence and vision of the many faculty, students, and activists who were involved in founding specific programs, but also because their efforts were backed by the force of the laws and executive orders that implemented affirmative action and by the public opinion that, though always divided on the issue, had been influenced by the struggle for women's and civil rights. Quote, affirmative action was the condition of possibility of founding and funding of women's studies in those years, writes Scott, as well as for increases in the admission of women to universities, professional schools, and faculties, unquote. The Chicago Center, too, was the fruit of affirmative action, she continued, but now the situation is reversed. Now, this is in 1996. Rather than facing off against hostile internal forces, advocates of gender studies had to make their case in a political context in which affirmative action itself had come under siege. The so-called culture wars, the debates over relativism, <clears throat> multiculturalism, and what many feared to be the deleterious effects on the university's mission to pursue knowledge and truth were all indications that the general climate of progressive change that characterized the achievement of affirmative action policies had come under attack and in many ways come to an end. Needless to say, this is a situation we find ourselves in today or worse. The takeaway point in Joan Scott's inaugural address, it seems to me, is that we must remain aware of the larger social and political context in which gender and sexuality studies can thrive or not. I think most of us who've been involved with gender and sexuality studies are aware of the ways in which our activities and the space that makes them possible is connected to and enabled by larger social political movements and structures. And yet, what will gender and sexuality studies look like in the future? under a Trump presidency, for example, although now he and Megyn Kelly have made up, right? He thinks she's great. They have a great relationship. Um, seriously, one of the many challenges facing the center as we move forward is how to develop gender and sexuality studies in a way that speak to the concerns of our students located as they are both in the academy and in the world. How can we engage in a form of world building here that extends beyond the academy? I say this in the spirit not of the usual lament about the relationship of theory to practice or the so-called ivory tower to the so-called real world, maybe a little, I say it that way, but more of a genuine question about how the center can continue to remain vibrant and connected to the things that brought people to gender and sexuality studies in the first place. Of course, what led to the founding of all these programs, as we know, was what was going on in the world in terms of social and political movements. And my sense as a director is that the thing that continues to bring people to the center is just this need to understand, you know, feeling bewildered about what is going on in the world and knowing that this is a place in which you can find like-minded people or like like bewildered people who who need to talk and figure out what is in fact happening okay so before we move to our first panel um, which is going to explore the founding of the center i want to call your attention to a few things first center staff have developed a few special items for your viewing you maybe have already noticed on the video screens a collection of photos and images from the center's archive. We're going to be running them between sessions tonight and tomorrow. There are also bound volumes with past center newsletters that provide a glimpse into the moments that make up the past 20 years. And there are posters on display on easels featuring milestones from the last 20 years. You're welcome and encouraged to add your own memories with the sticky notes provided. 
Additionally, we're excited to announce the launch of our new podcast, The Radius. The Radius will offer students at U Chicago an opportunity to share stories, interviews, and creative works on the gender and sexuality related topics they find compelling. With the assistance of the podcast's fantastic student-led editorial committee, students will also learn how to produce and edit their own audio content. The first episode is now available for streaming on our website. Looking to the future of this, this is where I do my pleading. Looking to the future of the center, it's crucial to secure the resources for the center <laughs> to serve as a permanent place for gender and sexuality scholarship at the University of Chicago. I'm pleased to announce that we've established an endowment fund for the center with the goal of raising $500,000 into uh, 2016. To date, we've raised over 200,000 toward that goal starting with a $100,000 gift from Dr. Nancy Warner and a $100,000 gift from uh, James Hormel. Additionally, the LGBT Alumni Association is raising $100,000 to fund an annual outstanding speaker series, which will bring relevant artists, activists, and scholars to campus for a two-day visit with our students, and which will also honor a, an undergraduate student who has done outstanding work in gender and sexuality studies. For our 20th anniversary, we're asking alumni, faculty, and friends of the center to give a gift honoring the many scholars who've built the center over the first two decades. You can help ensure the future of this scholarship by giving to the 20th anniversary fund. We just happen to have available cards and envelopes. <laughs> if you are able to give a gift tonight, or you may take a copy to send back to us later. You can also give by going to our website and clicking the green Make a Gift box mm -hmm. at the top of the page. And any gifts you may want to make tonight, you can just contact Gina Olson. She has a big purse with her just for this purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lastly, I'd like to invite you back to the center during Alumni Weekend on Saturday, June 4th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, faculty, alumni, and students will be celebrating the center's 20th anniversary with cocktails cocktails, music, and cake. <laughs> Before moving to our first panel, I also want to acknowledge the past directors of the center who've given so much in the past and continue to do so today. In chronological order, these directors include Leora Auslander, who's up here, Lauren Berland, who's right over there, Rebecca West, who's right here, George Chauncey, also up here, Deborah Nelson, I don't think she's here right now, and Jane Daly. And I want to acknowledge, yes. Good job. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge the amazing and devoted staff that the center has had over the years, without whom none of our dreams would have been realized. Um, and I, I'm not going to list all the staff we've had at the center over the many years, but be thinking of them, those of you who have known them. I'm simply going to say something about our, our current staff. So Gina Olson, who is our associate director, right here. Sarah Cooley, who is our program. Sarah, are you here? OK, OK, that's fine. A student affair administration, and, and Tate Brazos, who is our program coordinator. <laughs> who really, as you all know, make this place happen in every way and are responsible for so much of what you will be seeing and hearing tonight. Um, we've also been fortunate to have the support of provosts and deans who recognize the significance of the vision that animated the founding and continues to animate our work today. Thanks especially to Jeff Stone, who was a former provost, the founding of the center, and currently professor of law. John Boyer, dean of the college, who's kindly agreed to be on this panel tonight. Tom Rosenbaum was a former provost when I started my first term. Eric Isaacs, our current provost. Martha Roth, dean of the humanities division. And David Nirenberg, dean of the social science division, among others. So we thank you all. So I understand that my job is to keep the presenters to 10 minutes each. <laughs> huh. Well, that's, that's what I figure. I also want to just take the opportunity um, to shout out to Linda Zerilli whose leadership of this place has been absolutely transformative in the past years, and it's unrecognizable. We're going to go in the uh, order that our program says. 
Um, in order not to take up time, I'm just going to run through the panelists um, who are familiar to most of you already. Um, so we're going to start with Beth Helsinger, who is a uh, professor of English, who has an emerita now. Norma Field in East Asian Languages and Civilization. Um, Rebecca Zorak, who is not sitting in order. <laughs> <laughs> art, art History at Northwestern and previously of the University of Chicago. Uh, George Chauncey who is a member of the history department at Yale, but previously and gloriously a member of the department here. Michael Dawson, political science, as you know, and head of the, um, okay, I'm not gonna get the, the acronym, the I current mean, acronym I mean, I mean, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The Race Center. Center, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and Leora, down here, Leora Auslander, who is a first director and also professor in the history department, and John Boyer, dean of the college. So Beth, you're gonna, you're gonna start us out, right? Thanks. Um, well, it's great to be back with all of these people that I once worked with so hard. Um, I am going to be showing some images on that screen, so you might want to sit where you can actually see them. Um, since Leora, Leora assigned me to do 100 years of the deep history of the center <laughs> in 10 minutes, I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen, but I will race through this and hope that if you want more details, I've been just recently to the archives, so I refresh my memory. Two observations before I begin. First, the images I'm going to show you are appallingly amateurish. And second, the narrative they accompany suggests that what happened was a lot more purposeful and straightforward than it actually was. <laughs> the, the images are exactly what they look like, gleanings from an archive there to supplement and correct faulty memory. I hope their messiness will balance the overneat narrative that follows. The real history was a matter of bursts of energy and imagination followed by months or years of apathy and inaction <laughs> with a set of constantly changing goals and an ever-changing cast of characters. My apologies for omissions and errors. It's not easy to cover 100 years in 10 minutes. To all those named and many unnamed uh, who read and wrote and met and argued and put up posters and scrounged for funds and got exasperated or inspired by turns, thank you. And thank you, too, to those who took it from there, building a center that continues to exceed as much as it differs from anything we imagined in the deep, dark ages before 1996. <laughs> the university opened co-educational with nine women out of a faculty of 123. Six of 43 graduate fellowships were awarded to women. By the turn of the century, women students were nearly as numerous as men, a situation which caused alarmed faculty to vote for separate classes. <laughs> Fortunately, that didn't last long. The first faculty included a professor of history who was also dean of women and her assistant, Marion Talbot, who became dean in 1895, whom I think I had a great talk to you about earlier this year. In the 30 years that Talbot served as Dean of Women, she submitted annual reports on their status and constantly lobbied the President and Trustees for parity. She saw that dorms and a clubhouse were built for women equal to the men's. And I note that Ida Noyes opened in June 1916, exactly 100 years ago. She encouraged women's academic and social clubs, including the Women's Union, founded in 1901, of which we'll hear more. She worried, mothered, badgered, and regulated students, male and female, into a semblance of what she considered the civil conduct necessary for co-education. <laughs> but in 1925, when she retired, she reported that although there were many women students, there were no women trustees, women faculty were few and promoted with difficulty, those few were rarely, if ever, allowed into the faculty club. Mm -hmm. The number of fellowships for women graduate students remained low, and there were few or no public roles for women as guest lecturers or honorary degree recipients. <clears throat> After Talbot retired, there were no more deans of women. Indeed, women disappeared as a name presence for most of the next five decades. No one kept track of their numbers, their treatment, or their progress. In the president's annual reports to the trustees and alumni, students and faculty were referred to not just as the supposedly genderless he, but as the undoubtedly gendered men. <laughs> Some might regard this as progress, but not everyone agreed. A. Evelyn Newman, an alumna who wrote to, Pres wrote to President Burton, and I have read the gracious letter from you to the alumni. 
In this letter, you state that you are sure that we are more interested in the men of the university than in anything else concerning it. But, dear President Burton, almost half of the graduates of the University of Chicago are women, are they not? Such studied gender blindness, or depending on your point of view, such willful refusal to acknowledge that all were not in fact treated the same, was the norm for too much of the rest of the 20th century. Fast forward to the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> The 60s saw the beginnings of what was to prove a long process, moving the university not only to address the concerns of its women, but also to acknowledge gender, sexuality, and race as legitimate categories of knowledge, and thus of teaching and research. On and off campus, Hyde Park in the 60s and early 70s was home to a number of radical initiatives, including RAP, the Women's Radical Action Project, the Women's Experimental College of Hyde Park, Jane, local women activists who helped arrange and perform abortions, and the Women's Union, which came roaring back to life in a new form. Then in 1969 came the sit-in. 75 students demanded the reinstatement of radical political activist Marlene Dixon after the Department of Sociology declined to renew her appointment. When their petition was not answered, they staged an eight-day sit-in at the administration building that quickly became a campus-wide protest. After the sit-in ended, a committee was appointed to report on women at the university, a placating move that nonetheless laid a groundwork of information for later activists to build upon. With the aid of staff member Alice Chandler, the committee undertook the Amazonian task of assembling statistics and surveying students, faculty, and staff. Their recommendations seem modest now, although I note a request for child care referral service had to wait 20 years to be answered. <laughs> But the evident line of parody was sobering, as one frequently dissenting member of the committee, Joe Freeman, a graduate student in sociology, put it, quote, at the core of my interpretation of the data is the refusal of the university to give women as a group, take women as a group seriously. In this, it does no worse than reflect the general social attitude. But for a university that prides itself on its preeminence and on its incisive, skeptical approach, this conformity is hardly laudatory. Before I set foot in the university in 1972, I studied that 1970 report. But the campus seemed quiet compared to the passion and protest I had known at Columbia and in Boston. I taught a few student requested courses in what was then known as women in literature. With Janelle Mueller on leave, I was the only full -time, other full-time fact woman teaching in the department. The next chapter in the deep history of CSGS really opened in 1979 with a call to meeting by an ad hoc committee on the study of women. You may notice one or two familiar, now, by now familiar names. Elizabeth Abel, now a professor at Berkeley, who in 1982 edited the landmark issue of Critical Inquiry, Writing and Sexual Difference, and went on to publish Signs of the Times, The Visual Politics of Jim Crow. Catherine Borland, now a professor at Ohio State, State and the author of Unmasking Class, Gender, and Sexuality in Nicaraguan Festival, and a much cited article, That's Not What I Said, in Women's Words, The Feminist Practice of Oral History. Beryl Satter, now a professor of history at Rutgers Newark and author of Each Mind a Kingdom, American Women in the New Thought Movement, 1875-1920, and Family Properties, Race, Real Estate, and the Exploitation of Black Urban America a study of redlining in Chicago, where her father apparently was quite active, um, opposing. She is also the founder of the Queer Newark Oral History Project. And Sarah Shulman, so well known as a novelist, playwright, and lesbian activist as to need no further introduction. Sarah, I have not forgotten your salutary resisting presence in my class on American women poets. <laughs> this call was measured, but it was a call to action. Three years later, in 1982, a women's union circulated a position paper whose title is the first instance I've found at Chicago of a term that for some readers was more than a little threatening, feminist scholarship. <laughs> Abby Scher, Madeline Levin, Sally Wack, and Emily Olms called for a critical re-examination of the conceptual frameworks which resulted in the exclusion of women from scholarly research. Their paper concluded, quote, it is not enough merely to acknowledge the biases and lacunae inherent in our academic disciplines. We must correct and fill them and rethink the intellectual assumptions and cultural values that generated them. Not bad. 
Following that paper, a second meeting of faculty and students produced a working committee on feminist studies, a program of student faculty brown bag lunches, and a lecture series, The Forum for Feminist Scholarship, which ran for the rest of the decade. Um, that was one of the first uh, of that series. Uh, this is a, an address list I found from 1984 of the members of the Forum for Feminist Scholarship. You'll see are both faculty and graduate students. Some of you may recognize some names. Um, and this, a poster with its printed scream by Erica Rand, sitting back there, now professor of art and visual culture and women and gender studies at Bates College, author of Barbie's Queer Accessories, the Ellis Island Snow Globe, and Red Nails, Black Skates, Cash and Pleasure on and Off the Ice. By 1984, the farm had articulated as its long-term goal the establishment of a feminist studies program. But more immediately, the forum sought, and I'm quoting from their minutes, to make the academic community aware of the male-centeredness of its work, to focus attention on courses in the discipline, not men in the discipline, to mainstream scholarship on women and sexuality, beginning with core courses in the college, and to get faculty names attached, even male, to this organization. Letting faculty know there is a demand for women's courses and targeting departments where feminist issues are not being tackled. The Graduate Committee on the Study of Women then published the first of several directories of research by both students and faculty, designed not only to build a community, but to convince those who continue to dismiss such work as, in the words to me of one dean, a passing intellectual fad which the university should ignore. <laughs> 1992, all, 1982 also <clears throat> saw the first meetings of the long-running fem theory and crit, fem criticism and theory workshop. Fem theory workshops from 1988 joined by the gender and society workshop became continuing projects in educating both ourselves and the university community in such areas as feminist psychoanalysis, feminist cultural history, the politics of mass culture, women in revolutions, and feminist work on the bodies. Those were all the themes for, for subsequent years of the workshop. And here's a sample of public events organized in those years, which I'll have to run through very quickly. This was a great series, which, as you'll see, got funded actually by the Women's Board of the University and the Illinois Humanities Council. This, which was one of Lauren's um, organized uh, work series, uh, Imitations of Life, Workshops in Feminism and Culture. Again, I look to Lauren. Um, we can tell stories about that particular. <laughs> anyway. Now, I think Nan, Nan Golden never came out of her room, right? We, we tried to get her. But anyway, that was another issue. Um, and this, where, where we, uh, which I also remember um, very well. Yet the university was far behind other universities, as, as Linda pointed out, most of whom began women's studies programs in the 70s or early 80s. In 1992, as the university celebrated its centennial, a symposium on women in higher education put on ample display the tensions between the hopes of its early women pioneers and the disappointments of later years. As the 90s arrived, we realized, however, that it was time not just to dream our dreams, but to make them real. What could we do differently, starting a program so late in the game? We set out to imagine and then to build a gender studies program for the future by designing and teaching its courses now. Once gender studies existed de facto, it would have to be acknowledged de jure, or so we hoped. And it was, but it took a lot of work. A barrage of gender divas proposals submitted to the Frankie, the deans, the college, the provost, and the women's board, arguing for funds, for an office, for the freedom to do what we were already doing. The first years of teaching approaching approaches to gender studies the years of breakfast meetings hammering out a constitution, <laughs> raising funds, developing a public sphere, strategizing and planning for the future that became our present. But others are going to tell those stories. I want to close with two pages from the many memos exchanged in the heady year that three of us, Laura, Norma, and I, spent fantasizing about the gender studies program we might most want. 
We were indeed, as Norma wrote, giddy with all we did not know. <laughs> and in that moment when we could entertain so many possibilities, we tried to remind ourselves to be as radical as reality itself. Thanks. That last quote, to be as radical as reality itself, as far as I know, I first encountered it on my 16-year-old daughter's bedroom wall, and she s attributed it to Lenin. And <laughs> many years later, ha I became, what I've studied a lot is Japanese revolutionary literature, and mucking around those sources, I thought, I've got to track this down. Did Lenin really say this? And I've only, not knowing Slavic languages, that challenged me. I should have sought some collegial help. But it's something he s apparently said to a then um, anarch a Ukrainian anarchist who perhaps saw better of his ways after meeting with Lenin about his anarchism. But anyway, <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great statement, right? It, it can be you, it can, it can enliven so many things and, and encourages in so many ways. Thank you for reminding me about that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm getting giddy again. Um, I retired from East Asian languages in 2012. I came to the university in 1983. I was the first woman in my department um, not to be a language lecturer, which reminds us of a continual division of labor in kinds of teaching here, which was something that mattered to us continues to matter, I, I hope. Um, I benefited enormously from the path paved by Beth Helsinger in the humanities especially. And um, the Forum for Feminist Scholarship with Beth referred to was huge, that there was this place and you could go to dark spaces in Judd Hall, you know, at the end of the day in an undesirable part of the week and have a feminist lecturer. <laughs> There was that. It's better than not existing. In fact, we existed quite l in a lively fashion. And I myself um, was predominantly committed as a, on a regular basis to the Gender and Societies Workshop, which again was just really done by student initiative. Very international in scope, very, um, oh, colonialism, class aware, so forth and so on. He, wonderful for me intellectually and I think for many of others of us. Um, we've talked a bit about our belated institutionalization. Thank you again, Jeff Stone, when you were provost, and John Boyer. What institutionaliz institutionalization might mean? You know, it's, it's acknowledgment of the legitimacy of a, of a field, of a scholarly approach, the promise, absolutely fundamental material support, like a space up so that you don't, I think for a long time, all our records were in a shopping cart that Beth carted around. In my closet. <laughs> in, her, in her closet. <laughs> so have, all of that is huge. Um, but I think we were giddy. I think we took it as an invitation, maybe because we were so belated and surprised to find that actually this was going to happen at the University of Chicago. Um, we took it as, a, as an invitation to reinvent the world, or to put it slightly more soberly, to reconfigure the institution of the university by applying the lens of gender. Um, remember, it was Center for Gender Studies, that I realized, until 2011. Here's some of the divides I remember that we wanted to address and challenge, if not conquer altogether. Um, between humanities and social sciences on the one hand, and that can be refined further, right, between the interpretive and the quantitative, but uh, put together humanities and social sciences on the one hand, and biological sciences on the other. The divide of Ellis Avenue was huge then. It was also had to do with a particular period of feminist theory. Um, there was also the midway, the divide of the midway, even though there were fe um, active feminist colle uh, colleagues in the law school and so school of social so uh, service administration was an obvious place. Um, but we also wanted to address vertical stratification between faculty and staff, for example, and, uh, and others will talk more about this, but faculty and students, what kind of pedagogy did we want for this tender new thing that seemed to promise so much different. And then last and hardly least, between the university and the South Side community. 
Uh, Beth referred to breakfast meetings. I can say a little more precisely. We met every week, every week winter quarter of 1996 at 7 a.m. <laughs> happily, under the leadership of Jackie Baba at the Bonjour Bakery. I guess it's, it's been around for a long time, too. Um, we did not mind. Um, she was relatively new to the university, uh, will, would soon become head of the human rights program, which was also terrifically important in, in reconfiguring, producing new energy um, at the university. But at that point, she chaired our steering committee. So we were really trying to define a, a skeleton, what this thing might be, what the governing structure would be, and put some meat on it of activities, right, parts. All of this was later put to a vote and argued, but I think we were enthusiastic enough that it wasn't, um, we did not spend more time arguing than coming up with decisions. <laughs> <laughs> or we came up with decisions. And the first center at Judd Hall, I still remember so fondly under Lior's leadership with Julia Nitti Allen here. It was so much fun, you know, not just reinventing the world, but reinventing office decor. <laughs> but it, the, green sofa. the green sofa, I cannot forget it, you know? It, <laughs> but that was, that was, it was so huge that you, that you could have a different kind of space. <laughs> um, there was also something I think we affectionately called the dog and pony show. Right, to go in crossing over divides. Um, Leora and others, I don't know that if I ever did this, but were tireless in taking the message of this new living creature we had on campus. And I think we were met with considerable enthusiasm. I remember having, starting up a reading group where the reading material was decided by a staff person instead of a faculty person. That already was revolutionary, still might be revolutionary. Um, but, but, but the presumption, of course, was that drawing in sectors, um, I, I don't mean to sound top down here, but drawing in sectors uh, by announcing our birth, that we, um, that, that they, that this would be a way to transform the social dynamic that was established at this university and that was fundamental to the project of gender studies, gender and sexuality, and also our proximity by being physically close to the Center for Race, etc. <laughs> we know what we mean. That that was that 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 the um, spatial issues were fundamental to what we could know and the ease with which people could come and talk to each other. Um, I suppose, in some ways, this, this vision, this giddy vision um, with the dog and pony show, stood in some tension to another vision that, given our belatedness at an institution like the University of Chicago, it might be crucial to achieve what might be considered academic respectability. I suppose that these kinds of forces will always be in some kind of tension and different um, Will, there'll be different emphases depending on the historical moment and the other moments at play. And I think it's actually probably a valuable tension, but I just refer to that. Uh, I believe I was, I chaired something called the Public Sphere Committee. Um, and I do remember one of our members, Michelle Obama, coming to the <laughs> committee. She was then working at the hospital, coming with baby Malia, who was quite well behaved. <laughs> Imagine she's going to college mm -hmm. now. I want to finish really by referring to what our first major project was, the um, Public Affairs Committee. It was a May 1998 symposium, and I'm so grateful to Gina Olson for having dug up the text, because when I retired, I got rid of all my files. I thought to never open a box, never open letters from your family from the 60s when you first left Japan, because once you open, there will be no end to the reading. But um, at least I have a text. It was called, um, it was a day and a half in May of 98, Negotiating Difference, Gender, Race, the University, and the Community. I don't think any part of this will startle you, but I am taken, I am, my enthusiasm is sparked again when I think about a day and a half spent in this way. 
Um, the first part was um, titled Constructing the University, and we had Linda Seidel, art historian, moderating. We had a short history of the University of Chicago and gender at the University of Chicago. And then we went to a session on the city, and we had um, Sudhir Venkatesh then presenting on girl gangs. We had Roberta Feldman, professor of architecture from UIC, re uh, presenting on resident activism and public housing. And then we had a panel all with architects about architectural considerations of universi university planning, communities and conflicts, town and gown, designing the university, and the Illinois Institute of Technology in Bronzeville. So um, thematic, uh, durable conflicts and, and a history, right, um, laid out there. And then after lunch, we had a walk around campus. That session was called Bodybuilding, Gender Gyms at the U of C, a walking tour <laughs> led by Linda Seidel. And I think it's time to have that again. I bet you young <laughs> ones don't know about how gendered the gyms were. And we have all these structures, and I wonder how they would um, look under um, an analysis of gender and sexuality. Then we had a, a round table of social implications of urban and university planning. And from there, I see you know, quite Oh, high up administration types that one might easily have considered the enemy, um, invited to take part. Other quite radical people in the community, so quite an array. And then we had a talk with photographers um, and, and that wonderful exhibit in the space um, with a green sofa. Um, photographs of Englewood, Englewood Woodlawn and the greater Grand Boulevard areas, including storefronts, communities integrated and segregated, children and adults from the 1950s to the 1980s. I remember being stunned that one of the committee members, who was a staff member, told us that, in fact, she had sprung her father as a surprise. Wonderful photographs, but he had been, um, he worked for a Commonwealth Edison. So his existence at the University of Chicago campus was all under, in the basement level, looking at meters. Mm -hmm. And we had not known what a fabulous photographer he was above ground. So that was the kind of thing that happened in this space. And then the last day, um, we had a round table that John Boyer moderated. Um, and that was called University as Home. And it, was, it brought to mind, because we also had high-level administrators there. Um, in the earlier days of um, diversity consciousness and high-level administrative staff, too, who were generous enough to share with us memories of growing up in Hyde Park and issues of play dates and rules her mother said, which I can, st you know, given my faulty memory, I can still remember that her mother had a rule that she could not go play um, with a friend um, who would not come to her house, that there had to be reciprocity. There was a great deal of, there were, there were, there were revelations made over this day and a half. And finally, we ended up with a bus tour led by Professor Emeritus Timuel Black, great Chicago historian and ended up with lunch at Gladys's Luncheonette, which I learned was torn down in 2012. And I still have a note, please RSVP to Julia Nitti by the coffee break. Isn't that generous? You could, you could wait to make up your mind. And <laughs> till then, the coffee break of that day to go on a lunch tour. So that's how we launched ourselves, among other activities. Okay, so I... I <clears throat> I wrote out everything I was going to say so that I could stick to time, <clears throat> but I, um, I, then I, of course, worked on it and edited and changed, and so let's, I'll hope I can actually stick to time. So it's um, just a, a great pleasure to be among so many people who were so formative of my own intellectual development and my life at the university as a graduate student. Um, so I arrived here in 1993 as a student. And in my first years, um, I attended the Lesbian and Gay Studies Workshop, of which George Chauncey was faculty advisor, and took immensely challenging classes with Lauren Berlant and Leora Auslander. Um, and just so gender studies and uh, queer studies were just blowing my mind every day and every week. Um, it was, and it just, um, it, it was just a really incredible time, an incredibly um, intellectually um, expansive time. Um, but so thinking about the formation of the center, one of the things that was really impressive to me 
as the center was forming, as faculty were talking about it, um, and, and in terms of the classes that were um, that were offered in gender studies, was the extent to which students were, and graduate students in particular, were invited to participate in a more substantial way in teaching and research associated with the, the center in formation than in most sectors of the university, or at least in the humanities. Um, and the people I met through gender and sexuality studies classes were also, and workshops were also involved in other kinds of political organizing, and that was important to me too, I think, on issues of race, labor, healthcare, and other things. Um, so those were my points of entry, um, kind of intellectually, politically, into the process of developing the center. I have to say, it's amazing how much I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, but I, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to remember a few things um, here. But and and I was thinking about the breakfast when when Beth mentioned breakfast meetings. I immediately pictured the Medici. So maybe, yeah, okay. So so some of the I think some oh, of the maybe. committees were meeting at the Medici yeah. at seven a.m. <laughs> when when the, the Medici yeah. still served right. breakfast on weekdays. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So I honestly do not remember how I, uh, exactly how I got involved in discussions about the creation of the center. I remember that I somehow found myself in an early meeting in which we divided up into groups and I somehow found myself on the Constitution Committee. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that is the committee charged with writing the Constitution that would ostensibly govern the center. So you were volunteered. Did I volunteer? <laughs> you, were, like, you were volunteered. I was volunteered. Okay. Well. So how did a graduate student find herself on this of all committees? Um, with, within the constraints of a university structure in which all roles are not equivalent or equal, the faculty involved in the formation of the center were unusually attentive to the existence of power disparities within their own institution and unusually committed to efforts at mitigating the, their effects. Perhaps more correctly, to at least always be thinking about how to create a space in which to cultivate more democratic approaches to the creation and distribution and politics of knowledge. So in other words, thinking about feminist commitments not just as content, but as form and structure, and to think about them in a locally grounded way. So graduate students and undergraduate students and staff participated from the outset on all committees, and we wrote this inclusion into the document that we produced as the Constitution. But I have to admit that when Leora first asked me to be on this panel, I thought, well, what can I actually say um, about that document um, and about working on it? Of course, it was an exciting time of organization building as a collective and creative process, one I've certainly reflected back on as I've done research and writing on collaborative, socially engaged art, pro art projects, um, for instance. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why that's happening. Um, uh, but in writing the Constitution, we worked hard to produce a document that could establish a form for egalitarian space within a hierarchical institution. Faculty, staff, and student caucuses were all to meet regularly, and all were to be represented on a number of standing committees of the center. And so again, when Leora asked me, I thought, what could I actually say? What did come out of that process of constitution writing? Because in fact, it was impractical, <laughs> as utopias often are. Um, it was impractical with respect to labor. Who can be expected to donate their time and who cannot? What are the privileges and burdens of being able and expected to donate one's time? We thought we'd have so many people wanting to do work for the center that we'd have to have elections for committees. <laughs> 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 it was impractical with respect to the vulnerabilities of the less powerful in this arrangement. Um, and, and though I didn't have that perspective at the time, I'm certain from the point of view of faculty that it was impractical with respect to the efficiency and confidentiality required by certain types of decisions. Um, in the early years of the center when I was here as a still idealistic Harper Schmidt fellow before I became a jaded junior faculty member, um, I had to confront con confidentiality issues in some very challenging ways and to wonder whether in fact it wasn't such a good idea to embroil more vulnerable members of the committee in decisions about such things as the directorship of the center. But even if the Constitution Committee put a lot of labor into something that turned out to be fairly impractical, Looking back on it now, I, I do believe it was an enormously powerful learning experience for myself personally and for us as a group, um, that even to symbolically confront these issues was a powerful learning experience. Within the university context, it would have taken extraordinary effort to maintain the structure that we set out in the document. Um, and later, as a tenured faculty member here, 
I commented to my chair that I understood now that we could not have equity, transparency, and democracy in a department that had to function within the larger set of constraints that we had, both within and beyond the university. So it's not just a University of Chicago issue. Um, at, but in fact, and, I, and in fact that I understood that we couldn't even have two of them. But I would settle for one. <laughs> <laughs> So even to contemplate the expenditure of effort that it would have required to sustain such a space, a, a truly egalitarian space, as opposed to simply sketching it out, tells me, tells me something about what we're up against. And I think it told us all that at the time, even. I think we were conscious of the, you know, the, the fact that our desires and the practicalities were in some kind of tension. Um, but so importantly, I think that the, this utopian effort infused the center with its spirit and had a very concrete manifestation in a project that I'll talk a little bit about that was in turn formative for many of us. And I think the conference that, um, that Norma mentioned was um, in some way connected to this, this um, project. Although, because I wasn't here in 97, 98, I was off doing dissertation research, I'm not sure exactly what the relationship was. But as part of the effort at concretizing the theoretical structure of the Constitution, faculty, and in particular Leora, the first director of the center, encouraged the student caucus to organize events and projects and to work, um, I, I think, especially in the public sphere committee um, with Norma and others, um, to, to think about ways in which students could take um, leadership roles in defining projects and public, public projects at the center. So this discussion came to fruition as a multi-year series of invited lectures and an ongoing workshop on the broad theme of gender and space in which we developed themes that would be capped with a conference the following year, so that was 98-99, <clears throat> organized by me, Amy Bingaman, and Lise Shapiro-Sanders, who were all then PhD students, two of us in art history and one in English. Um, and Julia, um, Julia then Coyne, now, now, then Nitty, now Alan, <laughs> uh, it, uh, was, was also um, enormously, um, made enormous contributions to the organizing of that um, conference. So from the start, I think, um, in, at least in my experience of the, of, the, um, of the project of the center, we were addressing intersections and embodiments of race and gender and sexuality and the particular situation of the university on the south side of Chicago. And I'm, I was glad to have Norma, hear Norma speaking about the conference in 1998 because I, what I remember was that Norma was one person who was constantly putting this issue of the university's locatedness on the table and thinking, thinking about race and gender and sexuality um, intersectionally and thinking specifically about the, the space where we were. Um, so this was a, a cu crucial contribution. Um, I, on the other hand, was working on 16th century French art, a field <laughs> that barely exists in the United States, and one that I'm proud to say was recently maligned by Donald Trump's campaign <laughs> co-chair and <laughs> education <laughs> advisor, Sam Clovis, as part of a pol their policy proposal to tie student loan eligibility to subjects of study. So, boo hiss. Right? Um, <laughs> His, his quote was essentially, fine, go ahead and study 16th century French art, but don't expect to get a job. So I, look very, I feel very, very lucky <laughs> to have eventually gotten a job. Um, but this, this area of study sometimes felt constraining to me and could have been a very lonely one. But the center, along with a few other sites in the university, provided a community in my years as a graduate student and, and beyond. It made space for both theory and practice that cut across lines of specialization. So the topic that we chose for the extended workshop and conference project responded not only to our own is interests, those who were involved in, in organizing it, but to the interests we had been able to assemble together from other students. It was very much a collective effort. The conference w uh, was entitled Embodied Utopias, Gender, Social Change, and the Built Environment. And it later appeared with a number of changes um, in terms of the, the contributors as a book, Embodied Utopias, Gender, Social Change, and the Modern Metropolis, co-edited by me and along with Amy Bingaman and Lise Shapiro. So as Leora put it in her preface to the book, speaking about the center, we sought to be more egalitarian than is the norm in academic institutions. We tried to transcend barriers of practical and abstract knowledge, and we tried to engage as much in community building as in event production. Embodied Utopias happens to remain one of my most cited publications, um, certainly more than anything I've written on 16th century French art. <laughs> <laughs> and it has shaped my work ever since. 
Um, but this isn't what's most important about it. I think for those of us who were graduate students, it meant being taken seriously as contributors to a collective intellectual and political project, and not just as an audience for someone else's. And it is a reflection of the collective questions and energies that shaped the center in those early years, that process of, Im of imagining a shape for an organization, which was indeed a utopian one, and doing the work that sometimes boring, sometimes frustrating, sometimes exhilarating work to try to embody it. Thank you. So hello, everyone. It's really great to be back here, to be with so many people who were so important to my own intellectual formation. Um, I don't remember that I wasn't a part of the meeting of three, but I was a part of the massive reading group that we had for a year or two building. Was that on the Humanities Institute? Where did that meet? It was just Frankie. Yeah. So like 40, 50, 60 people gathering every couple of weeks. Really quite amazing. It's really a vital period for me. So I founded the Lesbian Gay Studies Project in 1997, two years after the founding of what was then the Center for Gender Studies itself. So this was after my book, Gay New York, had come out, and I wanted to try to um, expand the public sphere for LGBTQ studies. It was 1997, so we called it Lesbian and Gay Studies. Um, but to build, um, several of us working on this wanted to try to foster an intellectual community on campus that would explore these issues, to try to build the still quite nascent and fledging field, and uh, to support graduate students who wanted to do work in this area. And I'd say it's one of the things that's really striking to me, having moved to Yale from Chicago. Here, very much the focus was on graduate students, so that certainly we taught undergraduates and loved doing that. But um, unlike at Yale, where everything is about the undergraduates, um, the graduate student um, support, and thinking about what graduate students, how we could help train people who would go on and shape the field for years to come was, was really key. And in terms of the Lesbian Gay Studies Project, I really want, like several other people I have, to thank Jeff Stone, who provided the funding for it. Um, he was really an extraordinary provost, um, incredibly creative, responsive to good ideas. Uh, many of us benefited from that. But this was one thing I was deeply grateful to him for. And while I'm on the strike, I want to just have a shout out to Gina Olson. It's so great that you are still here. <laughs> <laughs> So in thinking about what would be the institutional home for this project, um, the center seemed the natural place. Uh, there were like-minded colleagues here with whom I'd already worked. Um, my own background was deeply influenced by feminist studies. Uh, my dissertation advisor was Nancy Cott, the women's historian. Um, the kind of relationship that we developed here was not universal by any means. Uh, but a common relationship of having some kind of uh, lesbian gay studies project in connection to a gender studies um, program. There were deep affinities, obviously, intellectual, a lot of shared theory, methodologies. Historically, in terms of the development of the field, uh, simpatico personnel involved in them. Um, but it also felt very important to recognize this as a distinct field that was not completely subsumed under what was then called gender studies, so now gender and sexuality studies. Um, it was new, and it was a moment when still naming these things seemed very important. Politics of recognition were important. And so to have a lesbian gay studies project, I, I used to think of it as a semi-autonomous republic <laughs> in, in the sphere <laughs> of the center. Um, and I have to say that I think we managed this pretty well, uh, since there was so much goodwill on all sides. And in fact, um, the project grew closer, I think, as time wore on. Uh, one example of that is the workshops themselves. There were several different feminist studies workshops that at some point were combined into what I think I remember was the Gender and Society workshop. And uh, we did start the um, Lesbian and Gay Studies workshop that Rebecca mentioned. And then in 2002, we actually merged those to create the Gender and Sexuality Studies workshop to pull graduate students and faculty together across those fields. Again, supporting graduate students was already always a really major focus. You have to go back to what it was like 20 years ago. I can't say that LGBTQ studies is a robust and institutionally well-developed field today around the country, uh, but there were even fewer university centers where it existed in those days. 
uh, and certainly very many fewer that had major graduate programs. Um, at Chicago, over the course of some years, there developed clusters of graduate students and a handful of departments. In history, students who come to work with me, and English, students who come to work with Lauren, anthropology, students who come to work with Beth Povinelli, uh, but not really any other departmental disciplinary clusters of students. Um, but there were very really, really few places for graduate students with interest in this field to go in the first place. And so Chicago always just attracts a lot of brilliant graduate students. And so we drew students across these departments um, because it was the University of Chicago. And so developing this interdisciplinary field of uh, lesbian and gay studies project, and particularly the workshop, um, felt really key as a place to try to build some sense of camaraderie and shared intellectual ground and to explore our differences. Uh, there was also a lot of work that we did actually to provide financial support to those students. Um, Chicago's funding is better, a lot better than it is now, than it was in my day, um, when it was pretty disastrously poor, actually. Uh, so the Hormel connection comes originally from my um, getting being put in touch with him, who's the one development lead I was put in touch with uh, <laughs> by the university. But he was a... Um, very successful, um, also the son of a very wealthy family who'd been an, an acting dean at Chicago and it went out to San Francisco and it was a major gay philanthropist there. And so um, he was quite open to the idea of supporting a Hormel Fellowship, which we had for any number of years, just provided an additional year of fellowship support for a student writing the dissertation in LGBT studies. Um, we also, I think, did do a few things that really did help build the field, and I'll mention just a couple. Um, the first was, um, for those of you who know this institutional history, the Mellon Foundation for many years has had a, something that's called the Sawyer Seminar, where they invite a group of faculty to come together and propose an interdisciplinary seminar that would last a year, uh, bringing in a couple of postdocs and... Um, uh, engaged in some project. We actually had one of, in the very first year of that program, we succeeded in getting one, uh, a Sawyer seminar on sexual identities and identity politics and transnational perspective in 1997-98 that a number of faculty were involved in and that Beth Povinelli and I chaired, um, which organized or co-organized a bi-weekly workshop, uh, taking up issues of thinking about sexuality and transnational perspective, uh, three conferences over the course of the year that investigated the transnational circulation of sexual identities, uh, practices, discourses, um, and politics. Um, and this is, I have to say, in retrospect, I realize it was actually pretty early in the transnational turn. Uh, and we published a special issue of GLQ in 1999 on thinking sexuality transnationally. Um, and it's had enduring influence for me, certainly, in thinking about these issues. Um, a second project was in 2000, where several graduate students and I organized a conference we call The Future of the Queer Past, a transnational history conference um, that remains actually the largest LGBT history conference ever to be held. Um, we drew together 200 historians from a dozen countries who spoke on 50 panels over the course of four days and had about 600 registered participants. Um, and we had exhibitions and a film program and Holly Hughes and Brian Freeman perform. But it was, it was an amazing moment. Um, it also took a year and a half out of my life and I'll never do anything like this again. <laughs> but, but, it, um, but it did actually, I think, play an important role in helping to constitute that as a field and, and pulling people together um, across the US and bringing in especially a lot of Europeans and Latin American um, to connect to this field and just whatever happened in the formal precincts of the conference, there's an enormous number of conversations and connections developed that were really um, rewarding. We also organized a lot of one-day conferences over the year, tried to do one a year. Um, and to a large degree, we tried to focus on questions of race and sexuality together. So one of the first was a conference on black GLBT politics in Chicago and nationally, organized in 2002, which I work with Kathy Cohen. It was one of the first things she did here. Um, Queer Latino America, Diasporas and Histories, 
organized in 2004 with Agnes Ligortiz, who's still here. Uh, Queer Islands, Caribbean LGBT writers and communities, organized by um, a postdoc here associated with um, Romance Languages, I think. Uh, but also a range. So Michael Camille worked with him to organize one called Objects of Desire, Homosexualities in the History of Collecting, uh, which is a really wonderful conference. Although Michael was not the most organized person I'd ever worked with, <laughs> <laughs> but he was brilliant. Uh, and then in my last year here, when I was interim director of CGS, to organize this for the, the main conference of the year, a conference called Transforming Knowledge, where we brought in four key people um, in the emerging field of trans studies to think about what it would mean for gender studies as a field to take trans studies seriously uh, and how that could indeed transform knowledge. And also because we're very keen to work with the Race Center, organized a conference on Walmart, which picks up on what a number of people have said about the interest in working, at, connecting to the community. It was a moment Walmart wanted to move into Chicago. And so we had a day-long conference to think about the history of Walmart um, and what it had done to communities around the country. Uh, so it was a very exciting and full decade um, for me. Um, a lot of wonderful collaborations. Um, the institution, the university, I have to say, provided incredible institutional support, and the center certainly um, provided tremendous logistical support for all of these ventures. Um, I, I don't want to end on a downer, <laughs> but I, I think it's also for us to be um, realistic um, and frank about what happened. What the university did not do was hire more faculty in the field. In fact, it lost faculty while I was here. Um, I will always be grateful to the University of Chicago because it hired me when no one else would. I'd actually been on the job market for three years. Uh, and I think if Chicago hadn't hired me, I would have ended my academic career. Uh, I had a postdoc one year and a replacement job for a women's historian one year, but, and I encountered, this is back in late 80s, early 90s, those three years, um, incredible overt anti-gay baiting on the job market. Um, as well as sort of systematic heterosexism and the marginalization of the field. And at that point, Chicago really did live up to the story it tells about itself. Um, they were the first people to read my dissertation and think this was really interesting because they'd never read anything like this before, instead of thinking this was scary and queer in every sense of that term because they'd never read anything like that before. And so I've said this many times, and I'll say this here. I'm always grateful to Chicago and... Um, I think it lived up to its reputation at that moment. At the same time, they did not hire many more people doing this work. And ultimately, what I was doing here was unsustainable, uh, which is one of the reasons I left. Um, and so I think this is something for us to think about in the sort of a larger array of thinking about what it means to institutionalize this kind of work at a university. Thanks. Good evening. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks with, well, at the time with a fairly unusual collaboration and one which has now endured uh, two decades as well as on the political context within which the study of gender and sexuality became a key component. I'll say it once so we, none of us have to say it again for the next few days. For the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. <laughs> there, we're done. <laughs> Um, and the scholarship and teaching and programming of the, center, of the center. As been mentioned several times already, both centers were established very late as compared to comparable centers of the study of sexuality and gender on one hand and race and ethnicity on the other. Um, black studies programs were being established in the late 1960s and early 1970s across the country in college and universities of all types, from Harvard to San Francisco State, from uh, Laney Community College, uh, to the University of Michigan, what some of us want to forget and what many of us want to at least distance ourselves from. These centers were founded <coughs> due to the fact that there was radical black student activism, which was a direct cause for the foundation of, of these centers. These were quickly followed by the formation of Chicano O and or ethnic studies programs, particularly in California. The University of Chicago is one of the very few universities where this did not happen. On some campuses, though, such as Berkeley, the Black Studies program had an antagonistic uh, relationship with many mainstream departments, which is still true, and as well as a troubled relationship with ethnic studies. 
Um, many campuses, black and ethnic studies departments, either had no relationship with women or gender studies programs. And on some campuses, the relationship was not very good. For us, the late start period had two major consequences as we took seriously the task of learning from the mistakes and problems other students had faced or were facing. Some of our decisions were driven by political and pragmatic reasons, as well as core scholarly principles and a desire to avoid the mistakes of others. For example, we did not, and really still do not, for reasons that George just alluded to, have sufficient faculty to support a full black studies program, let alone programs along the model of California University that often support black, Chicano, Oak, Asian American, and ethnic pro studies programs in various combinations. We wanted to be a comparative racial studies program, but we also had to be one given our resources. Our determination to build gender and sexuality studies into the core of CSRPC and partner with, was at the time the Center for Gender Studies was largely due to the activism and scholarship of feminists of color and their allies in the 1970s and 1980s and early 1990s. A strong black feminist perspective was being incorporated into some black studies department as early as the 1980s. Debates about standpoint theory and the triple oppression of women of color was debated within these units and in scholarly discourse more generally. At the same time, the work of those such as Cassie Cohen, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Barbara Ransby, and Elsa Barkley Brown was bringing black feminist perspectives, well as the study of sexuality into disciplines such as political science and history, not so much some other disciplines in the social scientists. Um, I'm thinking of one that just had a re really major center built on this campus. Um, and erasures of the role that women such as Ida B. Wells and Ella Baker had played in leading vital movements was challenged, the role that power and privilege had in determining which scholarship was worthwhile as fiercely debated in ethnic studies units as well in what was considered at the time mainstream departments. Given the leadership of those such as Cassie Cohen and others on this county, the study of gender and sexuality would become a continuous focus of CSRPC's work. But it was also a time when debate about race, sexuality, and gender was extremely conflictual within American politics. In the years immediately preceding the founding of both centers, debates around the first Clarence Thomas and Nita Hills hearing in 1991, and then the Million, Mar Mar Million Man March in 1995, involved scholars, activists, and grassroots members of communities of color, including scholars in Chicago and NSS University. There was a fierce debate within the academy about masculinity and male privilege. These debates also occurred in the midst of the HIV AIDS crisis, which also served to bring questions of the role that heteronormativity played within communities of colors into sharp relief, and the critique of respectability politics and the patriarchal policing of women bodies was brought to bear on how power worked to marginalize LGBT communities of color. This was a context within which our centers cooperated from the beginning, sharing a less than wonderful space in Judd Hall. <laughs> Leora Auslander played a leading role in forging the long-lasting cooperation between the two centers as we wrote grants together, negotiated with the administration for resources, not always successfully, and negotiated with each other then, as we do now, about when we got to install art installations in the center. <laughs> <laughs> and then as now, many of the installations focused simultaneously on sexuality, race, and gender. I even came to enjoy our trip to second-hand stores on Belmont looking for used furniture, including that damn green couch, <laughs> for our shared space. Although it was probably a really bad idea for me to stop as we did some of the time at a really good bakery on Belmont. <laughs> the legacy of the initial cooperation which just accelerated under Kathy Cohen's directorship had led to a continued robust and evolving relationship between the centers, which has been vital for CSRPC students and faculty. One of the best examples of the cooperation is a joint pre-doctoral fellowship that we offer between the two centers. I would argue, though, that we're still, however, running behind where many of our peers have successfully moved. We still have problems on this campus convincing departments and schools to hire the finest scholars who happen to work on gender, sexuality, and race in various combinations. Our peers' response to this universal problem has often been to form departments that can directly hire scholars of the highest caliber. <coughs> directly into, uh, who work in these domains directly into uh, women's studies or gender studies departments or race and ethnic studies department. Similarly, we constantly hear from undergraduate and graduate students who argue passionately and convincingly that the lack of diversity in the curriculum is not so much a question of identity politics, but a critical intellectual failing in their education. Challenges existed and continue to exist. But there has been, I would continue I would argue, immense continuing intellectual and programmatic payoff to 
to our collaboration. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me. I, I wanted to speak in a little, slightly different vein, more from a maybe more context than text. I, I, I first uh, encountered or uh, met um, 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 colleagues who were interested in gender studies in a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think back, I, mean, I think we're all kind of wrecking our memories here. Uh, um, I, I think it was the spring of 1989, and I remember it was a meeting in um, some room in, um, in Regenstein Library, and I think it was uh, Beth and, um, and uh, Norma and uh, Lauren Berlant, and I don't know whether Leora was there or not, but it was a meeting where you guys came and asked for money. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, it was a meeting in which, um, uh, so it was the, no, I, think there was the I, I don't think you were there, but you may have been there, but uh, Ralph Nicholas was there and Richard Stryer, uh, they were other officers of the college at the time, and, and I said so it was these kind of three women against the three men. It was a very, very interesting meeting, and I still remember the, the kind of social dynamics of it. And, and there were, it, was, it was a complicated meeting. And I, I remember thinking that um, you were both outraged and also somewhat humiliated in a way. It was, it was a complicated meeting. And, uh, uh, or maybe humiliated was not too, but you, you felt like you had to kind of defend what you were doing, and I, which I found ethnic, kind of ethnographically very, very interesting. Um, and of, of the three men, I was the only one who had any money. Uh, so the, it, it became, uh, uh, and, I, and that's the story I'd like to tell us, how I came to have the money and what we did with the money. Um, so uh, w w uh, the, the project that um, uh, Norman, and Beth, and Lauren were wanting to do was to try to create a, uh, a presence or a more significant and systematic presence of, of the study of gender and women's studies in, in, in the undergraduate curriculum. There had been a number of courses, and we later did an inventory, and, and there were actually a number of courses involving these subjects, but there was no course that actually was a kind of a systematic overview, and there was also no course in which graduate students would have a chance to uh, learn to teach these subjects. Um, and so that was their request, um, that they wanted to have a, a planning program, a, a workshop, a, a pedagogy workshop, as I remember, and then they wanted to institutionalize and, 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 and present a course for undergraduates that would be taught by a, a team of graduate students and faculty. And so um, it, it, it seemed to me like it was an interesting idea, and so I, uh, I, I agreed to give them $9,000 uh, to start the course, and then later on the college gave more money, and I think uh, by the mid-1990s, next to Stone, and Jeff Stone, we were the biggest donors to the Gender Studies program, um, which I think was a, a, a good thing, but it, 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 this all came out of this initial intervention uh, in 1989, and the money, at least, that uh, we initially committed came from the Ford Foundation. So I, I want to talk a little bit about that grant, because it's an interesting um, episode in the history of the organizational knowledge at the university, and I think it says a lot about some of the other issues that other colleagues have been saying. So um, this was a grant. At that point, I was not dean of the college. I was, it was called the Master of the Social Science Collegiate Division, which is a very um, a, a kind of prosaic and pompous title at the same, at one at the same time, but basically I was responsible for social science in the college. And I had taken over as a uh, master in 1987, and what I encountered was a lot of um, 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 unhappiness on the part of the faculty with the common core curriculum back then. The, the, what you had was a, a change of generations, you had a, um, a sense of uh, many older faculty holding on to core courses that they had organized in the 50s, 60s, and even in the 70s. There were younger faculty who basically did not want to teach other people's courses. Um, so there were, there were issues of authority, there were issues of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of age, uh, 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 generational age, uh, but there were also issues of ideology and, and approaches to knowledge. Um, and um, we were having, and the college was much smaller back then than, than it is now, we were having, actually having a hard time staffing core courses. And so um, 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 uh, I, I met a, a, a lady from uh, the Port Foundation, her name is Sheila Biddle, who was a real hero in my book, and she actually had a program. It was one of the last grants, I think, that the Port Foundation ever gave for undergraduate education in liberal arts. They no longer do that, basically. Um, and so she, she basically made available to me as master $300,000 to uh, um, try to uh, put some, uh, as it were, bread on the water of curricular change and renewal, which in $300,000 in 1987 was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a lot of money. Back then, it was, it was actually a lot of money. Um, and uh, I think I had more money than some deans did at that time. Um, and so we, we basically issued a call for proposals to try to uh, revive and transform and re-enliven Chicago's traditions in general education, which were always interdisciplinary, because in, in the history of the university, you had basically 
the interdisciplinary parts, with the exception of uh, human development and uh, child development, youth development, and social thought, were actually in the college. There was actually very little interdisciplinary work in, 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 the, um, in, the, in the graduate programs, which were very much dominated by these very traditional, powerful departments. Uh, and and uh, these were departments which various people sought to undermine and, and, and attack. The most famous kind of attacker of the, against these departments was Hutchins. And he basically failed. They, they, they basically crushed him. And one of the reasons he, he left uh, or was driven out in 1950-51 is basically the departments had beaten him. Uh, he had a proposal to create an interdisciplinary PhD program. And basically, uh, the faculty launched this extraordinary um, a petition denouncing him for trying to take away the, the rights of the departments to offer the PhD, which is what he was trying to do. And, and, and he thought departments were nefarious, and, and futile, and reactionary instruments, and they, they ought to be, if the, he could do away with them. But uh, anyway, they did away with him. Uh, so um, uh, so we, we got the grant, uh, and um, I, I remember uh, a number of things began to happen. We began to issue grants for people who were to try to re-enliven or reimagine re existing courses. So we developed a program called the Ford Foundation Lectures in the Social Sciences, where we would bring people in to tell us how social science was being taught, you know, general social science out of the universities, because since Chicago was very famous, they thought, I think everybody thought, well, we kind of, we know, we know social science. It turned out, well, they knew some social science, but they didn't know everything about social science. And, um, and we brought in uh, scholars uh, to reimagine the African Civilization Course. I remember the Comoros played a big role in this day of a, a conference and developed new readers. Uh, we uh, provided funds to reimagine re re the Islamic Civilization Course and the, um, and the South Asian Civilization Course and so forth. And so on. so there, there was a lot of work there uh, that went on. It was really quite exciting. Uh, and and, um, and at that, then at some point, um, uh, I met y you folks, and um, it, it occurred to me that um, that the interdisciplinary um, <coughs> rhetoric that we were using uh, and accustomed to use about ourselves on the undergraduate level in terms of general education, which was you know part of the traditional college, uh, that it might be interesting to see if we could kind of move that up the, the line a little bit, um, because what initially what what the colleagues in gender studies were not talking about was the gender studies core, which we now have, but it was actually something else. I, it was more, on the, I think, probably more tending toward the major, which we ended up, ended up having in, in, in the mid-1990s. And so um, um, it began, and uh, I'll just read a couple of, uh, uh, these are uh, reports that I, I was constantly having to report to the Ford Foundation of how we were using their money, which is actually a, an interesting exercise. And I, I, I said, um, the college's curriculum is a living thing. It must change and adapt or it will vegetate and eventually die. Yet such a progressive evolutionary image if presented in ignorance of our past fails to do justice to the complexity of the college, for we have courses of study and traditions of pedagogical thought which we have successfully endured for a half a century. In the end, the success of our curriculum will lay in its ability to recognize and honor the past successes while supporting forward-looking innovations. And then um, the... Um, um, and, and, and gender studies basically become a kind of, became a kind of forward-looking innovation. Um, and then I, uh, uh, the next year's report to Ford, I, I reported to them the Ford grant has a, uh, been most useful in supporting a large number of small to mid-range projects. We believe that on, it is on this level that curricular theory is best transformed into practice. We know the Gatling gun approaches to curricular improvements. That's basically the central administration telling the faculty what to do. Um, often miss their targets, whereas well-aimed single shots often make a far bigger impact. Hence, we've been se selective in supporting ventures, waiting until the appropriate faculty group is ready to proceed, and equally important until they have an effective plan for proceeding. And then finally, uh, as a kind of a, a third uh, element, uh, this was a, the, fi the, the next year after the course had gotten started. This was not the major. It was not the center. This was simply the course, but I think these, this was a very important yeah. nascent beginning. Um, I said a second new initiative, this was on the level of, of, of these kind of beyond the core, has come from a group of colleagues interested in linking social science and civilizational studies in the context of gender studies. At least this is the way it, you know, we, we were thinking about it then. Leora Auslander, Beth Helsinger, Lauren Berlant, and Norma Field have organized a planning workshop which has led to the construction of a new multi-quarter multi interdisciplinary course uh, on the study of gender. Right? It was called Problems in Gender Studies. Not only is this course of value to our college students, so I reported to the Ford Foundation, but it will serve as a laboratory for graduate students interested in learning, in learning and it will afford teaching opportunities to these students. This was in 1992. And so I, uh, if one then thinks about what happened to the college curriculum later uh, over the course of the 1990s, um, the, uh, we approved a um, new major in African and African American Studies in 1991. 
um, a uh, major in environmental studies in 1993, Jewish studies in 1992-93, um, law letters and society, which was basically legal studies, which was uh, uh, you know, very different but also very similar in the sense of challenging the dominance of the departments in 1992, public policy studies in 1990, uh, global international studies, and Norma was involved in that, that took a little longer in 1996, cinema media studies in 1996. Uh, and so the, the 1990s, in a sense, these were all in some ways, from my perspective, children of the Ford Grant. Uh, they, they all came out of <laughs> an attempt to kind of break open the dominance of the departments on the undergraduate level. Uh, because before these, these programs emerged, our, our, our undergraduate majors tended to map very much on the traditional departments. We had very few interdisciplinary majors. And I think if, um, um, if one wants to think about you know, power relations with the university and who gets to appoint what. Uh, what the, 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 the fact that we had very powerful departments is in some ways related to the, I mean, George alluded to this, the, the large presence of graduate students, but of course we forget that the large presence of graduate students consisted of students who had no money because mm -hmm. what they were doing because of the collapse of college enrollments in the 50s and 60s is using graduate students to substitute undergraduate students because they admitted large numbers of graduate students who would then pay tuition. They, they had very few fellowships. That, and this was quite a deliberate strategy. And then you, you would use them to replace your undergraduates since we were kind of missing in action because we, we, had, we didn't have any of those people. And so you, you, you ended up with very powerful departments, um, which are, uh, you could say, traditional, conservative, I mean, you know, whatever, but who then monopolized faculty appointments and, 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 and stymied the, the, uh, uh, or prevented the ability of these, these nascent uh, new initiatives for, to have, the, to, to have the, the right to have uh, appointed powers, which in some ways is still the case today, I, I would say. It's not quite, as, um, quite, quite so, so much so. So in any way, I, I guess my, my, my um, I, I want to conclude by thank you, thanking you for your delegation in 1989. <laughs> it, was, um, it was a fascinating, and it's one of these things where you never know what's going to happen, because this was a grant that was originally trying to revive kind of dying core courses of the 50s and 60s, but it ended up spawning a lot of new core courses and also new interdisciplinary majors in the 1990s. And for that, so for that, I'm very grateful. So thank you. And it has to be said, of course, that John and Jeff were two who got it with a little persuasion, at least, and who really did support us. So we are grateful for that. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I saved the last word for myself, partially in the hopes that everybody would say everything for me so I wouldn't have to. Um, and people have said a great deal. So um, I, uh, but there are, I do still want to say some things. Um, it's, um, I mean, people have said a little about their arrival here, and I don't want to go on, but I, uh, I, I came here in 1987 with an unfinished dissertation. Um, and uh, from having been a student of Joan Scott's at Brown, which was sort of a queendom at the time, there was an incredible strength of gender and feminist and uh, lesbian studies at Brown, and then I'd been in Paris doing dissertation research and participating in feminist politics in the city. And then I came here, and frankly, I, and I, was, I came here because I was so seduced by the intellectual vibrancy of this, of, of this place. Uh, and then I got here and I was completely shocked. Um, I, was a th I was a third woman in a department of 40. Um, which was a startling thing at that point. And then luckily I met the same people who we keep talking about. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. Um, and uh, we can, you know, we can start, we can do, you know, I can, I can join some other folk and we can, and we can do something. So, um, and, I, and one of the things that hasn't been mentioned yet is in the process of, of, of institutionalization, we actually talked about whether we should or not. Mm. That is, we weren't actually certain that it was such a great idea. Um, and um, the great fear of ghettoization. The, the great fear of ghettoization mm -hmm. and the great fear of co-optation, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. Uh, and so because I think one of the things that, that I, at least I have a strong stake in, in remembering is that um, the project has political roots as well as intellectual roots. Mm -hmm. And at least for a number of us, the, the motivation for, for the work we were doing before the center as well as the work doing in the center um, was political and intellectual, which is not always easy. Uh, was was not easy at the time, and I don't think I don't think it's easy in the present. Um, and because I think that I mean some of what people have talked about in terms of the mission to break hierarchy, 
and to engage the community sits with difficulty, um, with uh, notions of you know, conventional definitions of academic excellence and criteria for selection and choice and so on. And so um, I think that one of, the, one of the things I found so exhilarating about the initial community of, of uh, graduate students, undergraduates, because there were undergraduates who were also really involved and really active in shaping things, uh, staff and faculty colleagues, was that we could actually talk and argue about those things, because we didn't all agree um, about how politics and, and intellectual life should be interrelated. And it was, but it was a space in which that was something one could actually say and fight about, and we came to various resolutions. So it was utopian, it was also conflictual. Um, in, a, in, I think, a way, it wasn't always, the, all the conflict wasn't fun, but I think it was incredibly productive. And, um, and so, I mean, some of the, um, and, and another tension I think that would be interesting just to, to remember, um, that there was, all, there was also no women's center, or and no center for gay, lesbian students. I mean, there's no, there were no services of that kind for the students at that point. And so one of the pressures we felt, some of us felt, and desires was also to actually be useful in a kind of pragmatic way and to substitute for what wasn't here. But we decided rather definitively not to do that because the issue of ghettoization was a really powerful one, and also delegitimization that we felt very, very strongly about creating a space and the legitimacy for the intellectual project of gender and sexuality. And we thought if we became a service provider, we would be in direct contradiction to the really, really tough struggle of persuading people that we were doing something that was intellectually valid. I mean, uh, shortly after, I mean, uh, something that I'm sure John remembers and I think other people <coughs> here is that after the creation of, this, of both of the centers, the Center for Race, Politics, and Culture and the Center for Gender Studies, a lot of the alums went nuts. Mm -hmm. And they were, there was a very strong counter reaction. And, and that, that discussion about the abandonments of standards and, mm -hmm. and faddishness and so on. And, um, and I was, shortly after I, I um, was, you know, was, was honored and delighted to be, you know, have the chance to be, be the director of this thing, uh, I got a call from, this, from President Sonnenschein, who, uh, who called me in, and, um, and I was kind of uh, petrified, frankly. Um, and because there had been this big blow up in the alumni magazine um, with really, truly nasty stuff out there. And he, uh, and, he, and, and he said, well, you know, you need to explain yourself, and you need to explain yourselves, and what it is that you're doing. And I thought, oh boy, you know, there goes the funding. Um, and that wasn't the issue at all. He actually wanted me to provide language to, with which to respond, because it wasn't his field. I mean, there was, he was an economist. There's no reason why he should know how to, how to um, talk back. But that there, there was an, admi you know, and so we were in that moment, there was the tension between trying to fulfill the radical project and trying to establish a legitimacy in what was a very conservative institution in many ways, intellectually conservative, was, you know, was just a, a tension. Uh, and, uh, and I think is one that, uh, and, but it was also very productive because I do think a lot of the energy and the dynamism, intellectual and otherwise, why we did go to those seven o'clock in the morning meetings, month after month after month, <laughs> and you know, comb the secondhand stores for hideous couches, um, was because was not just to further knowledge. You know, it was because we thought we were making the world better, and we thought we were making the university better, and we thought we were making space for people to produce different kinds of knowledge. So problems in gender studies that John was talking about, that was co-taught. It wasn't a TA situation, it wasn't an internship situation. It was a co-taught between a faculty member and a graduate student in a different discipline. So, the, so the, diff, the student in the different discipline knew more than the faculty member about what she knew or he knew. And so it really did break hierarchy. I, I taught that course over and over, and I can't tell you how much I learned, including from one of my people sitting here. Uh, that it was um, it was a transformative course um, for um, but and and not just for the I mean I think for the undergraduates because they also got to see that uh, that uh, that somebody not that much older than themselves could know more than the, than the older person and that there was this complicated dynamic of now knowledge and power that we had a very radical vision that we were trying to. Um, to create, and as, as also in the notion of incorporating uh, uh, staff, secretaries, administrative people of various kinds into, as was mentioned, the actual organization and intellectual and, and pedagogic projects, um, that 
which was incredibly difficult. Um, and we often blew it in various ways. It was very hard to do, and it, I don't think that's, I don't think, I, and I think it's, it's, it was difficult to sustain, but part of the, the idea, again, was of actually embodying situated knowledge. So living the principle that people who have different experiences of life produce different forms of knowledge, have different pedagogic capacities, and need to be in conversation. And that wasn't happening anywhere else in the university. Um, and it was something that we came into existence to do. Um, so I think that all of those are part of the heritage that I at least hold very dear, um, and, uh, I th and that I think is, was something that was fairly particular, and it comes out of feminist politics, which, were, you know, the personal is political, and that whole logic was what we were coming from. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to say, or one of the other things was, and George was talking about the Lesbian and Gay Studies Project, and one of the, and, 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 and um, the question, on, and Michael was talking about the, you know, the co-founding, basically, of the two, of the two centers, and, and we were sort of muttering before this, Michael and I, before it started, that that, that dualism seemed right. That mm -hmm. is, that there should be the Center for Race, Politics, and Culture, the Center for Gender Studies, or the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, that were separate but linked in this way um, to be able to collaborate but not collapsed into a center of otherness, uh, <laughs> which has been done in some places. Um, <laughs> but, um, and so to keep them in dialogue, in, in an intimate dialogue, but, and I think we have avoided you know, many of the, you know, where people get to be true, choose if you are black or a female or whatever. Um, I think we made a mistake in not, in not making it the center for, for the study of gender and sexuality from the beginning. I mean, I think, which isn't to say that there shouldn't have still been a separate um, project, but I think that, uh, and I, we were already doing something, we'd already jumped women's studies, um, and so we never even had that discussion, or practically didn't, which everybody else was going through those, those decisions, those, those fights, discussions, should we still be women's studies, should we become gender and women, should we become, and we'd, that one we avoided, but I think, uh, I think it would have been, I think we would have done things somewhat differently if we had thought that one through better, and that would have been interesting to, I mean, it's, it's later, it's okay, but, but I think, um, I think we could have been uh, even, I think we could have been more creative in what we were doing and, and that, that collaboration, because I think there was still something we, we did better on blending, I think at times, race and gender than we did actually gender and sexuality, um, which, is, which is surprising, um, but I, that's my, I mean, that's something one could, one could talk, and, and I was thinking, I, 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 um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say, I went to look at Yale what, and the names of your, of your structures now and saw that, so you're, there's, a, there's a program in lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender studies, and then there's another one in women's gender and sexuality studies um, at Yale, and I thought that was an interesting, that's not true? That's what the website says. <laughs> <laughs> no, the key word is program. There's a program in right. WGSS. And there's right. a committee on LGBT studies, okay. right. which With different is resources. a different thing. Right. Does different things. Right. Um, another. So anyway, that's something I would, you know, sort of going forward, it would be interesting to keep talking about those divisions. Um, something else that we didn't do, very consciously didn't do when we started, was to create the course that we created two years ago, the the, the gender and sexuality civilizations course. Um, and we didn't partially as part of the utopian vision that Rebecca was talking about which was we thought we could infiltrate the whole thing. You know, our goal was mm -hmm. to use the center to subvert the whole core. Um, and that we would get, and that it wasn't a good idea to create our own gender sexuality sequence because then it would let everybody else off the hook and the girls could do the girl thing and everybody else could just keep doing their thing. And so we thought, no, we shouldn't do that. And, but we failed um, to, to seriously uh, infiltrate the core. I mean, part of why, I mean, the, the part of why, there was a lot of motivations for creating the, 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 the gender sexuality civilization sequence, and it's an incredible success, and we have waiting lists, I don't know what the, what the bidding was, a hundred and some odd for the, so uh, the, the pent-up demand is, is phenomenal, I think it's a, I think it's a great course. Um, but, um, but part of it also was that, you know, we didn't, if you look at the curricula for most of the core courses, there's not a whole lot of gender or sexuality. So just as there isn't the, you know, the, I mean, George has never been replaced, for example. There's no figure who plays the role that he plays. Just as a faculty, there's been a, there's a real problem with hiring. Uh, there's a real problem in persuading the colleagues that this is actually important stuff to be taught. 
So, um, so that was, um, and so we weren't, you know, weren't able to use to do it in that way. And it'll be, and and it, and, and there's an argument for maybe once you've got a core, then the students from that core will then go to other con classes and say, you know, well, where, you know, what's wrong with this class that this stuff isn't here. Um, and um, and which takes me just to the, the question of, which has also already been raised, of centers versus departments. Because another reason we created, we, we decided in, to institutionalize despite our fears about it, was we were exhausted. <laughs> and we were beyond exhausted. Um, and because this was all free labor um, on top of everything else we were doing. Um, and now everybody's exhausted at the University of Chicago. That's just a state of being. But, it, but we were really exhausted. Um, and we thought this would help. Um, and um, it kind of has, I think. Um, but, uh, but it's the problem when there aren't appointments. And uh, so that it's still, the departments still have primary claim on all of the faculty. And so things like directorships are, it's hard to, because people need to chair their departments. They need to do the departments pay us. And so they get first dibs. Uh, and so that's, that's an issue in terms of, so to, 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 to become a center but not to become a department. You, there's an enormous, and in some ways we created a massive amount of work for ourselves, um, which is great. It's good to have the work, and it's incredibly good work, incredibly important work, but it, it's, but there's, there's more, there's, and we've, the resources, I mean, this building is fat, you know, when one thinks about the shift from the green sofa to here, right, and it's really amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, the resources have, you know, the, the, the support from the college, the provost, the university, I mean, it's, it, it, it's tremendously helpful. But um, but the, the problem of um, the problem of, of being of trying to do everything we try to do without departmental status is um, is a is a real problem, and including the the, the fundraising mandate um, since there is that notion I mean that the, the 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 money that you've talked about raising is fantastic, um, and I remember you know part of the dog and pony show was within the university part of it was these incredible fundraising gigs we went on. And yes, yeah, Sue was a central person. Julia was a I mean, we and we had no idea what we were doing. Absolutely no idea. And and there again, the intersection of politics and intellectual life gets complicated because there you'll, you'll remember this, Sue. There was the idea that we were we were trying to get money from the Hefners. <laughs> And so, yeah, I mean, we were going everywhere to get money. Um, and, but then the idea, you know, that we'd become the bunny club, you know, I mean, there, was, there was a kind of lovely, there's a lovely thing about the idea that the Hefners would fund the Center for Gender Studies. That, that, was, that was sort of beautiful. Um, but at the same time, the, and the, and the uh, but, but it was American girl. American girl. No, no, I mean, Right. I mean, and so there is, I mean, again, the university has been generous, but there is this assumption that we will find money. And a different, departments too need to find money, but it's a different, it's a different relationship. And when you're a center for gender studies, a center for study of gender and sexuality, the question of from whom and how and why is not exactly the same as when you're a history department, which has its own challenges, but it's, it's a very particular set of challenges. And so, um, I think that um, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I you know the the job that's been done. I mean, I was I was over the last twenty years, and particularly last you know the last seventeen years um, is, um, is is extraordinary. I think. I mean, I think you all are great. Um, and but it just there's there's still work. There's still work going forward, and including I think if we can um, figure out how to get more positions, so that there'll be more people to teach. So, thank you. So thank you. Great. Well, there's time for questions, so I hope you have some. Or comments. <laughs> or comments. Yes. <laughs> Manifestos. <laughs> Lucy. Well, why don't we just have a department? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It's, I mean, I, I, it's a difficult, given the, the financial situation that we keep hearing about, it does not seem like an ideal moment to be trying to create new, new units, but, um, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. No, there, there's the, certainly the, the certainly the undergraduate interest in everything we teach. One of the problems with a with a department is a department, at least as things are currently structured, has to be in one division. Yeah. Right. And right. That was that was never the. Right. Right. Yeah. We've always straddled in this awkward way. Yeah. Yeah, just as a matter of curiosity, um, where did the major funding come for this incredible redoing? I mean, it was great already, even just get into this building, yeah. and then from where we were. But then, the, but then the rehab changed it completely. Yeah. Yeah, I actually just wanted to comment briefly on the department question. So this is the distinction between the two units yeah. at Yale. Uh, WGSS is a program which is kind of a second tier department, but there are a lot of really vibrant programs that are almost departments like American Studies, which is huge, and a major. Program, uh, program at Yale is a program, as is WGSS, but it does mean you get lines. But what it actually means is that theoretically you get lines. Uh -huh. And so at Yale, it is a program, but it for a very long time had two half lines, and then eventually got one full line, and then a second full line, and then finally a third full line, but that person left, and it's unclear. There's supposed to be five lines. Anyway, it's just mm. it, it's it's the possibility it opens the structural possibility, and, and the advantage is it does mean you don't have to be constantly calling fully volunteer labor to be your director of undergraduate studies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those can be core faculty, but it doesn't guarantee anything. Mm. Um, um, yes, for the first time. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it, um, but that's only in the last five years. And then the Committee on LGBT Studies right. is more of a research unit, and there are a lot of wealthy alumni. I mean, Chicago is really lucky to have someone as generous and progressive and forward-thinking as Jim Hormel to be a supporter. Um, there are many more alumni from Yale who've given money, and so it has a variety of pots of money to distribute to our faculty and graduate and undergraduate research and that programming and that sort of thing, but that's the distinction. Mm. So I guess my question kind of touches on similar divides, being that the, the center versus the department. So I was just kind of curious from your experience here, it sounded like a lot of you touched on the fact that the center or the creation of the center or even before it existed was your source of community. and. So I was wondering, especially now, since you're obviously in home departments um, as well, how you've been able to take that community, um, gender, sexuality, or race studies, into your own discipline, um, and kind of what the difficulties you face, because as someone who defines themselves primarily as a gender scholar first, and then as more discipline scholar second, um, I feel that divide is mm. permanent. Uh, so. I'd just like to hear your thoughts about where, how you were able to leverage the communities that you created in these spaces um, in your in your home discipline. Mm. Yeah. to say. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hard. <laughs> I don't know what other other yeah. people have things to say. I think yeah. One one way I think is is actually the. I mean, the colleague, the it's different. I mean, even I'm a historian. Even the the when working with colleagues in the center, and then historian, other historians, and then going back to the department, it's different than if you had never been here. Mm -hmm. So that it creates, I mean, that it, there are different conversations and different level, different kinds of interests. So that, it's, so that you sort of literally remake the community elsewhere, and then car that carry that physical community back again. But sometimes I think it's been a question of gathering sort of emotional yeah. oomph from one mm -hmm. place that you, it's not a very satisfying answer. Yeah. Um, and it is one of the problems with not being a department, because what would be nice is to be able, because one of the things about not, most people I think are primarily, who get hired here are primarily disciplinary, and then gender, because that's how departments hire. 
whereas if one had a department that was primarily gender sexuality, that could be one's primary. And, and you could do different kinds of work but that wouldn't have to be recognizable in, in another discipline. And I think, anyway, that's a, it's a, there's an intellectual argument also for that, for that change, but that doesn't help answer the question. So Michael rubbing his face. <laughs> well, I think that race and ethnic studies is in a slightly better position than gender and sexuality studies. So that there's actual there's um, within political science at least a recognition of that as a core field within the, on some years. <laughs> uh, a lot of it depends on who the chair is. Some of it depends on the balance of power within the department. Um, but it's also the case that um, our graduate students still have a lot of problems with microaggressions uh, among with their peers and actually spend more time here in this, this actual space we are in right now than they do in the department. Um, so it's complicated and often difficult. And we run to this type of problem. I think all of us run into the type of problem that George described. You have a stellar scholar. That person goes somewhere else, let's say to Columbia, um, in the political <laughs> science space, um, and the uh, desire to replace them is non-existent. Well, one, one little thing occurs to me. When I was chair of English, which was um, 1998 to 2005, I remember that a question came up which I was able to push in the right direction, I think, which was um, there were faculty were in English were required to teach two of their courses in the Common Core. Um, English, at least, counted teaching approaches to gender studies mm -hmm. towards that requirement. I don't know if all other departments did, but that would be one little point where negotiating with the then people in charge of the department would be one way of doing that. Um, the, the other thing is that the workshops um, for faculty and graduate students um, have always been another kind of place where you could have an identity which wasn't just department defined. And so the gender and society workshop or the fem theory and criticism workshop were one of those places. Now, I don't know, would you say that the center took the place of the workshops or simply, I, I, I mean, there's my, that would be my question. I don't know. They're still here. I mean, they're, there's new versions of it. I mean, that is, it's just this is a home yeah. now for them. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to say, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with the kind of interior history of, of Yale's departments, but the, the departments of Chicago have always been uh, very much uh, defined and defining of themselves in terms of as PhD kind of production units or PhD factories, and um, and they define themselves. Uh, I mean, cer certainly. I mean, let me be candid. Certainly not as undergraduate majors. I mean, that's for many of our that's just an afterthought. Uh, you know, um, uh, that, that sounds like, like a moral statement. I don't mean it as a moral statement. It's just a, it, it, not English. Not English, but. Uh, um, <laughs> but 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 so that in a way it would seem that if, if gender studies were to become a department, it would have to become a different kind of a department uh, because I don't think that your PhD program could be the same as a PhD program in history or chemistry or, or, or physics. Uh, uh, so, uh, but, and it may be that we're approaching a time in the organization of all these great universities where the department itself is, is a somewhat antiquated structure. I, I, in my own view is, is it is. I think the Hutchins was right. Uh, I, mean, I think he was right 60 years ago. Um, but that's a very, very difficult battle to fight. And, and it's, uh, because you end up with very strange allies and very, you, you, your best friends don't talk to you. Because uh, it's, it's like, you know, uh, one of the many schemes I had as dean is uh, uh, some of my colleagues, you know, I, I once raised the issue about the quarter system. I mean, the quarter system is completely anachronistic in my view. It was created at a very different time and place for a kind of semi-agricultural or industrial uh, world that no longer exists. Um, and I once raised the issue, and I remember telling, like, if you do that, we won't talk to you. I mean, these are my friends on the faculty. Uh, I said, wow, like, uh, I mean, talk, talk about, you know, Chicago's willing to talk about anything. Well, they're not willing to talk about the quarter system, I'll tell you that. So uh, 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 whether they're willing to talk about departments or not, uh, uh, you know, that would be a rather brave thing to take on. So. Mm. One, one thing that I would also add is that I think in I think in some departments, and this was the case for mine here, 
that um, it's, it, there, was, there was a shift from the 80s or 90s to the present where gender and sexuality became something that it was fine to be interested in. <laughs> not, it, was not, you know, it wasn't something you had to kind of feel necessarily that you were contesting your colleagues over, but, um, but that not so many people wanted to teach. And, and you know, I mean, it, when, when I was, every, you know, every time I taught a gender studies class, it was, you know, I was the only person ever teaching a class that was defined as gender studies in art history. Um, and, um, and it was also taking away from something else that I felt like I needed to teach because we were all stretched so thin that we were, you know, trying to, I was trying to, you know, fill this gap and fill this, this other gap and this other gap. And so, it, it, you know, it, it, and I think, this, you know, the same was true of a lot of people. There were plenty of colleagues who probably would have liked to have taught a gender studies class or, a, you know, a, an art history class that was, that was framed as being about gender and sexuality studies but just felt like there were too many other things they also had to be doing and covering. Um, so there wasn't, so I think that meant that there wasn't, you know, a community of people kind of teaching and talking about, um, about the subject matter, yeah. One thing that's happened in a number of black studies programs is they've started PhD programs and then they, being, they were able to become departments. And that's so in many cases, the PhD program was actually the leader. And in, at least at Harvard and Yale, the students that have gone into Yale's and Harvard's FM program who are interested in, in race and studies have been stronger than the students who have gone into the disciplinary departments. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly a demand for people of really high quality uh, undergraduates wanting to do graduate work in gender and sexuality studies and race and ethnicity. Exhaustion seems to have set in. <laughs> <laughs> creating that community that I think has been very central to my time here. And I don't know if I would still be here if it didn't exist. So thank you so much for creating that community and allowing the rest of us to benefit from it. It means a lot. This is something very subtle, but um, was important for me was the kinds of emphasis or kinds of attention we paid in the pedagogy both in problems of gender studies and the pedagogy practicum about how people seated around a table interacted. And I, f I was department chair for a while too, and I found that learning, um, learning what was valuable to notice and what was valuable to insist upon in, in saying yourself or getting said from others, that was enormously important. And there were there are times in, in the department I belong to where that kind of decorum would take over, and there are other times when some somebody's on leave in a small department or some somebody is left or whatever, and, and, and which it also affected interaction among graduate students. So I think that kind of attention was and remains really valuable. Yes. I was going to say, I, I would certainly say, because, uh, you know, join Norma, it was an amazing experience, both creating the gender studies sequence and teaching in it those first couple of years. We mm -hmm. both taught it in the first yeah, couple of did. years and yeah. being paired with, it was Nyan Shah for yeah. me. Oh, yes. who, who was it? Carol. Cara. That's right. Oh, and we we met, I think, yeah, practically every other week all summer we long. <laughs> the students in Norman, yeah, what are we going to do? What are we gonna, and argued about the readings and yeah. so forth. And But yes, I think you're right. Um, the experience of that, of the workshops, of our steering and constitutional committee meetings, it's certainly carried over in giving me not only knowledge about how to do these things, but also sort of the confidence to say, okay, I mean, if we could create something out of nothing and then, uh, you know, persuade the deans and, and provosts that it had to exist because it already existed and therefore they could recognize it, then, you know, running a department, ah. <laughs> we could do that. And, and legitimacy, right? Legitimacy about what we felt was a bad way of interacting among colleagues, for example. Yeah, yeah. And there are different ways that different ones of us would go about addressing that. But I think it was just a very important practicing ground of 
our emotions, our ideas, and how we were going to express them, and who would back us up. Yeah. And who to turn to for that little bit of money, <laughs> <laughs> who to talk to, which staff members, which et cetera, yeah. all that. Yeah.